Councillor Fuller. Are there any declarations of interest? No. no, I can't imagine what they would be on this. Um, I was quite shocked to see that our last meeting was back in June. Um, so I had to reread the minutes because I couldn't quite remember what we discussed, but I couldn't see any problems with them. Is everybody else happy with them? Can I can I say something, Leslie? Yeah, of course. Um, on the uh, in, initial update on progress, our new strategic flood risk assessment, um, it was, I think it was a third point down and it was talking about storm surges and it difficult to, to predict. If I can just say on the 1st of February, I went over to Zealand with the Straits Committee to commemorate the surge tide they had. And I'm only mentioning this really because they lost 1,853 people in 53 drowned in their sleep because it came through at night. Um, and that surge was five metres high. Was it? Because it affected the East Coast as well, didn't it, here? Yeah, we lost 44 people in, in Essex, but only one in Kent, I believe, officially. Um, but yeah, it affected the whole part, the lower part of the North Sea. But because the wind was a northwesterly direction, it actually hit their coast worse. So since then, they have built some amazing sea defences, obviously, a couple of times. And they spend about 10 percent of their gross national product on sea defences, Holland. That is a so, lot of money, isn't it? It's a lot of money because they take it very seriously and they still do. But five metres high, when I explained that to New Romney Town Council, the look in their faces was quite poetic. But Thank anyway, you. I'll mention it. OK, oh, well, welcome, Connor. You Hi, got Connor. in in the end. <laughs> yeah, bit of a bit of a palaver, but yeah, got there yeah. in the end. OK, well, you haven't missed much because we waited a bit. So we've just done uh, apologies and declarations of interest in the minute so far. So I'm now going to hand over to Jill for the housing service approach to decarbonation. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, and thank you for inviting me, councillors. I'm just going to share my screen, if that's OK with you. Can you see the presentation? Yes, yes, I can. Yeah. Thank you. It's, yeah, quite small. Can. it's quite small on my screen, actually, as I've got your um, dialogue next to it. So, oh, OK, um, I think I need to. Switch. Is that better? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. OK, um, so, yeah, just to, to let you know that um, uh, you've been you've invited me to here today to, to, to attend the, the Climate and Ecological ecological emergency working group to talk about housing services approach to carbon reduction um, and how we um, in housing can help folks in the high district council to deliver on our climate change pledge um, we are committed to doing everything that we can to try to reduce our carbon emissions across the housing the council housing portfolio and we're work, working to uh, achieve net zero carbon by 2050 um, I'm sure you'll be aware that this is just a reminder for you of the vision that we set out when the Landlord Housing Service came back in house from East Kent Housing Almo in October 2020. Um, the service owns and manages 3,337 homes, 18% of which are traditional independent living schemes or sheltered housing for older people. Um, when the housing service came back to the council, we had a historical lack of investment in our stock to contend with and we were under a regulatory notice for health and safety compliance failings. So um, obviously our focus at the time was around improving performance and I'm pleased to say that by uh, building a, a new compliant housing service uh, learning more, knowing more about our assets and investing in improving the stock, uh, as well as concentrating on um, decent home standard and keeping our residents safe and secure, uh, meeting the, the, the legislation, the current legislation and the new legislation and engaging, most importantly, engaging with our tenants. Um, we did come out of regulation by uh, August 2021. 
I mentioned um, knowing more about our assets uh, in order to know what, what we needed to do to improve them. And as you'll be aware, we carried out an extensive stock condition survey in 2021 um, by a company called Rapleys. And the housing asset management strategy was agreed by Cabinet and published in January 2022. This is a key delivery document that sets out how the service will deliver in terms of improving the assets and re redressing the lack of investment in the housing stock in recent years. Um, in 2022, our capital planned works improvement budget was 8.97 million um, but for across the whole of the homes and the estate with a, about a million on, on new kitchens and bathrooms. And you know, it's important that we do keep a significant level of uh, capital investment in, in our stock. And I'm going to sort of talk, that, talk through some of that in, in this presentation. Um, as you can see, objective three down there, this, was, this is a very key objective for the asset management strategy uh, to improve the energy efficiency of the housing stock and ways of working that reduce carbon emissions and levels of fuel poverty by achieving a minimum EPC rating of C by 2030 and aiming to achieve net zero carbon in use by 2050 for all of our housing stock. At the moment, this is very much a strategic intent um, and in line with the wider council pledge to reduce carbon emissions as set out in the, the net zero toolkit. But the, the first part of, of this objective um, and working towards net zero carbon or that objective of, of improving um, our stock and, and bringing them up to EPC level C over the next five to seven years um, is, is the key thing here. As we do anticipate it will become legislation for rented property to meet this energy efficiency rating by 2028. And um, we do feel that this is uh, achievable as an objective. I just wanted to, to show you this, this slide. The asset management strategy is, of course, a primary document in the Library of Publications that feed into our 30 year housing revenue account HRA business plan which underpins everything that we do in housing um, and we are currently working on updating the HRA business plan. So I'm not going to go through them all but you can see there that there's a number of documents, um, some of which are already published and out there, um, others of which um, are to be developed throughout 2023. Um, including developing a housing approach to carbon reduction. Um, this was a key action in the asset management strategy, and um, we are hoping that we can develop this document and take it um, through the government's process into Cabinet in June 2023, so we can publish it as soon as possible this year. Um, whilst most of our strategies and policies are in place, the Independent Living Improvement Plan um, again, is something that is currently in development and we're hoping to agree that later in, in the year, along with the annual Major Capital Works five year delivery programme, um, which we're hoping to publish um, once we've we've got that completed alongside the, the HRA business plan. So in the asset management strategy, um, we make a very strong commitment to the following priorities. And these are also um, priorities that some of you may have seen that we discussed with Overview and Scrutiny Committee recently. Um, so number one, ensuring homes are safe and compliant at all times, um, keeping residents safe in their homes and um, also meeting new legislation, including the regulator of social housing's new 22 robust tenant satisfaction measures, which we will be measured against from April 2024. Um, of course, running an excellent tenancy management service and responsive repair service remain a high priority. Meeting decent homes and capital investment in our improvements um, is still extremely important for us so that we continue to remain compliant uh, around decent homes. Decent Homes 2 um, or Decent Homes Plus, as some people are calling it, will be coming into effect soon, which is likely to be more around, less around the, the homes themselves and more around the environment that people live in, um, which will 
be yet another challenge for us to incorporate into our programme. Um, the capital programme includes determining the future use, design and locations of our ind independent living um, schemes and ensuring these assets are not only just fit for uh, use and design um, and uh, fit for purpose for the future, but also that the environment, well-being and the quality of life of our older residents is prioritised. Um, number four there is decarbonisation and retrofitting. Um, very, very important. These There are so many dependencies, though, on achieving our commitments around this, and I'm going to go into that in lots of detail um, a, a bit later in this pr uh, presentation. And finally, whilst we, of course, want to meet future housing need and provide more affordable homes for local people, uh, the Council's um, new build target is one of many competing demands on the available resources in the HRA. Um, but we will continue with our acquisitions programme, especially focusing on um, buybacks of right to buy, pre former right to buy homes. So on to the um, housing carbon reduction approach 2003 um, document. As I'm sure you're aware, the council have been working towards um, achieving our climate change emergency pledge. Um, and of course, this means doing everything we can to, um, that we are committed to reducing the carbon emissions across across the portfolio. The, the folks and high social housing stock is responsible for quite a large proportion of all the council's carbon emissions. With our 18% of independent living stock, being one of the highest energy users and carbon emitters um, across the portfolio. And bearing in mind the lack of in investment that I have mentioned previously in our stock over previous years, um, this document um, that we're developing is focusing on setting out how the housing service will meet our, our first target of getting all our stock up to EPCC in the next five to seven years. Um, and then how we, what other steps we're going to, to move, use to move towards net zero carbon. And this approach has considered the key factors listed here. Uh, so the current knowledge of our housing stock based on the comprehensive survey that we had done, uh, which surveyed approximately 100% of stock externally and 90% internally. The future expectations for social housing and the increased population of older tenants, um, along with the expectations and changing needs of current and future tenants. The carbon housing, um, the housing carbon reduction action um, document will cover um, in quite a lot of detail retrofitting existing housing stock with energy efficiency measures. And um, we're looking at our target EPC 2030 um, means that we will have to retrofit around a third of our stock. And although this is a challenge, we are confident that it can be achieved. However, achieving net zero carbon uh, by, or EPCA by 2050 is a much bigger challenge. And we don't yet know what government funding assistance may be available to support this ambition. Um, in, in the document, we talk about retrofit principles, uh, how the housing team, the housing operations team can help promote this with sort of agile working and ensuring that we support digitalization as much as possible. Um, also, how we can um, achieve net zero carbon ready for our affordable new build homes and general approaches to reducing carbon emissions in the sector. Most importantly, or not most importantly, but very importantly, active um, behavioural change is covered in the in the new document. Um, so this is informing and publicising more about how tenants living in these new energy efficient homes will need to amend their lifestyles in order to get the best from the new technology. So embracing smart tech. Um, digital reporting repairs online and our new service housing online is just to start as a self-service portal for tenants to help them understand more about the direction in which all of this is going. 
Um, and we do, of course, need to engage and involve tenants and stakeholders, bringing them along on the journey with us. Um, as, as you'll be aware, um, in two, 2021, the government announced 3.8 billion um, commitment over 10 year period to improve the energy um, performance of socially rented homes. The Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund, or SHDF, um, we were successful in being awarded £2 million government grant in wave one um, to increase the energy efficiency of 109 of our worst performing homes up to EPCC with match funding of 900k from the HRA. This award also um, allowed us to be able to complete the fabric first part of the work at Ross House, which when completed will be our first flagship uh, zero carbon retrofit scheme of 16 apartments, 16 properties. We have submitted a bid under wave two, and we should hear about that very soon. Um, they keep moving moving the goalposts as to when they're going to be telling us, but hopefully it will be in um, early March. This will be a two year programme, 2023, four and four, five, to improve a further 300 homes. If we are successful, the grant um, would be uh, around 5.1 million across the two years and we are required to do 50% match funding from the HRA. But obviously there is this what if we don't receive um, wave two, if we're not successful in that bid, there will still be a nearly a, a, about 900, nearly a thousand homes to bring up to EPC. They will see by 2030 as per our asset management pledge. Um, and we will then have till 2020 to increase the energy efficiency across the whole portfolio. So that's still there. And also there's the, the unknown around retrofit technology. It's still in very early stages in a lot of respects. Where others have installed in, um, air source or ground source heat pumps in the sector, because everything is so new, their lifespan predictions um, are untried and untested. So it's difficult for us to predict the long term maintenance and replacement of, of such, such technology. Also, we don't know what future technology there will be. We understand that there are some trials going on with um, existing gas pipes around things like hydrogen. So perhaps hydrogen heating systems um, may be a, a thing for the future. These uncertainties all mean that it is very challenging for us to accurately forecast decarbonisation costs in our 30 year HRA business plan. This, this just um, gives you uh, a detail around our approach to retrofitting. So fabric first, which is what we're on at the moment, is making sure that we're doing um, a lot of insulation work, roof, um, walls, making sure windows are secure in terms of um, energy efficiency and that our homes are as energy efficient as possible. And that's what Wave 1 was all about as well. Um, we're also taking the approach worst first, as I mentioned earlier. So those EPC um, properties with EPC rating of D, E and, and, and lower. And also least regrets. So making sure that this is all coordinated with our plans work, uh, our planned work schedules and um, programmes. Uh, we, we don't want to be going in there um, and doing work in a property only a few years later then to, to rip it all out and, and, and do other work. So that needs to be really carefully guided as we go through this process. Um, and this, I think, is my last slide. So finally, I just wanted to touch on, um, and it will, it is in the document, um, achieving net zero carbon in um, new build affordable homes. So meeting future social housing needs is, is, is as I said, very important to, to us in housing. And um, as you know, we have about 1,500 people on the housing waiting list at the moment. And um, we also have changing demographics. The census last year, um, you know, it indicates to us that this number is, is just increasing and it will continue increase, uh, to increase over coming years. And also we have an ageing population in the Folkestone and Hyde district. So that presents a challenge in providing more affordable housing fit for purpose for all age groups and the um, HRA affordable new build target in the current financial cl climate has been affected as as have 
our existing programs with by supply chain costs and inflation um, and uh, the recent amendments to the building regs, part L and F, mean that planners are looking for much higher energy efficiency specs, which makes new build much more expensive for the HRA. So in the housing um, carbon reduction approach, we have taken the line that any new homes should be net zero carbon ready, um, which means that they're not going to be actually um, full net zero carbon and until the the grid is decarbonized um, and the council's net zero toolkit includes a, a 60 page section on new build which communicates how developers that are um how developers can work with us and we can help facilitate um designing and, and constructing higher environmental standards for those wishing to build new homes in in the district as a housing service, we do want to ensure that um, we do everything we can to facilitate our partners um, to new build affordable homes and that they are as energy efficient and environmentally friendly as possible. So I think that's my last. Yes, indeed. So hopefully that's given you a whistle stop. I'm just going to come back to you all so that I can see if there are any questions. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, you're facing a huge amount of challenges. Um, it is disappointing, I think, that the new build will just be net zero carbon ready rather than net zero carbon. But I, you know, I can understand the financial challenges. One of the things that is bothering me, actually, obviously, we included the sheltered housing in our basis when we looked at our carbon emissions. And that is going to be how we measure whether we meet our target of net zero for the whole council by 2030. But from what you're saying, you're only looking at EPC by 2030. So I think that there's, there's, a, there's an issue there. I just wonder how you think we're going to meet that gap. OK, um, the the independent living um, scheme, most of the communal areas are already EPCC, um, which is quite interesting because some of the flats are actually not. Um, so when we are, were actually preparing wave, the wave one bid, we weren't able to include any of the independent living schemes um, in, in the wave one criteria because it didn't qualify. Um, ha and also in the it's the same, the same is that you know it's the same situation with wave two. How however we are not confident, but we're hoping that come come way three, if there are su subsequent government waves, um, that that they will actually stop start to review that EPC rating as the criteria and start to view it in a slightly wider context. Um, in which case, that that would in, mean that we can include the independent living schemes in this energy efficiency um, program that we're we're compiling. Having said that, we're not going to sit on our laurels with the independent living scheme. We are we are looking at an independent living pro. Um, improvement program, as I mentioned, improvement plan. And part of that is um, picking up on some of the recommendations that we had from, we had a company called ARC come in to look at um, all of the assets, the independent living assets, and a number of recommendations, including improving energy efficiency, were made around modernising those schemes. Um, and that is something that we are looking at costing out within the HRA business plan. So we are we are looking to spend some money um, and part of that money will be doing some energy efficiency work um, as part of the improved programme. So that won't, that won't be net zero. What you're saying is that's going to be EPCC. So that does it, 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 would, it won't be net zero um, no. until we I mean, we're talking about the the work that we need to do between 2030 and 2050. And that that's the key work that we need to really focus on. Our climate declaration was said that the council's estate, which we have included the sheltered housing in, would be net zero by 2030. So that's obviously a contradiction there at the moment. And I don't know, we can talk later because we can talk about the carbon action plan, but obviously we have commissioned some work with carbon descent. So we'll, we'll talk, we'll go back to this later because I know Connor has had his hand up and, and others. Sure. Connor? Thanks. Um, yeah, obviously you said there that, you know, all new builds would be, um, you know, net zero carbon ready. 
moving forward. Obviously, the, the Radnor Park Road schemes, you know, just about to come online. And obviously, they've still got gas boilers. Um, I know we're going to take over some stuff from Shetway Close, which I believe is a little bit more moving towards that. But I mean, when when will that be the reality? I mean, is there anything else in the pipeline that still, you know, that, that was agreed some time ago that that isn't new build ready? Because you don't want to come out and say that you're, you know, everything we everything we build is new build ready, and then you announce we're we've just we've just given fourteen homes to people with gas boilers in. You see what I'm saying? So when yeah. when will what is the first scheme from and then moving on that that will actually be be as it as it's as it's stated? Okay, so um, Highview was in fact the first scheme um, that we were working on with regards to um, net, net zero carbon ready. Um, we we're, were also were looking and, and will be looking as as part of planning spe um, spe specifications around Biggins Wood and also Ship Street. So those those schemes are the schemes that we're looking at net zero carbon for. Okay, Tony. Uh, thanks, Leslie. Um, thank you, Jill, for your presentation. <clears throat> it's a, it's, you've got a lot of work on your hands. Um, but a couple of points. On your diagrams, you showed about the installation of properties and the like. You didn't mention heat stress, which worries me, and climate change. A big of elderly people is going to be a major killer if you're not careful. You can insulate properties, but if you don't want to make them <laughs> death cells <laughs> when it comes to intense heat. So that's the first thing. And secondly, I'm very interested about blended hydrogen um, because it could enable us to use existing gas boilers. And you quite rightly say in that county, we've got the same problem. Um, mm. One is getting heat pumps installed. We don't know how long they're going to last. You quite rightly pointed it out. We also don't always know how efficient they are in different situations. So there's a lot of unknowns we've still got to find. Um, but I am interested in blended hydrogen. If we can use green hydrogen, obviously, that's the best sort, rather it being produced by other forms. But I'll be interested in views on that, really. Thank you. On the first point, you're, you're quite right. Um, heat, heat stress is is a key key thing when you're talking about insulation. Um, and we we work we work with um, uh, something called PAS PAS twenty. 2030, well, 2035 actually, um, assessors who come in to our homes and they do a, a full assessment um, around the, what's needed in that home. Um, they're few and far between, but we've we've got some good ones on board uh, for, for Wave One, which who have been fantastic. And you get a full written report as to, to what's needed in that home. And it's very key that the insulation has to take into account. Um, Keeping keeping the home cool and ventilated in the summer months, and then keeping it warm and insulated in the winter months. Um, so that's that's a key factor in retrofit. It's it's sometimes a challenge. I, I won't lie to you. You know, it is it, with with the design of some of the existing properties that we have, it is quite um, challenging to to have that balance. But certainly with new build. That's obviously something that we can we can make sure that um, is high priority for for new build. In terms of hydrogen, I, I don't profess to be a, a an expert. I'm, I'm I'm interested in the subject and I'm trying to find out more about um, how it how it could work. But I think it's yeah. There's there's gonna there's gonna come a point when, when we're talking about least regrets that I was talking about in my um, my presentation. There's going to come a point where yeah, we have a we have a boiler replacement program, but there's going to come a point where at some point in the next X number of years, we'll start saying, OK, we'll get to the point where we don't want to be replacing any more gas boilers. We want to be starting to go down a different line. And for me, the hydrogen with the gas network already in place is a very, very, very interesting prospect because, you know, air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, um, are challenging in themselves. The technology is still very expensive to install, and we don't necessarily have the infrastructure out there to maintain them um, yet. Yep. So I, I'm really interested to see what happens with these these um, hydrogen tests that they're doing at the moment on the gas network. Thanks, Jill. Thank you. Connor? 
Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's uh, what I was going to say sort of links to that a little bit as well. So obviously, you know, you're obviously looking constantly at new technologies and what's what's coming forward and, and you know, what might be what might be suitable. Um, you know, uh, the other week I was reading up about, you know, electric wallpaper and 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 and, and all that. And how that sort of all works. So, I mean, per, it'd be it'd be amazing. You know, any any sort of stuff that you get, you know, um, trials that have been done around the country on various sorts of technologies. It would be really great if this committee could have sight of those. You know, just moving forward. I think personally, I'd find it quite insightful. Yeah, absolutely. We can share best practice. There's there's quite a lot of um, seminars and things going on out there at the moment about various things. And um, we, we we did have a, I had a meeting um, not, not so long ago with one of the the big ground source heat uh, pump um, companies, and they're quite keen. Um, they'll do a, they'll go and do a free assessment free assessment on um, one of our independent living schemes, and I'm hoping that I can get them to go out onto the marsh because that's one of the areas that I think it will be really useful um, to actually have an assessment around whether ground source would be a, a better a better fit for that sort of environment topography. Mm. Yeah, that'd be interesting to see what they come up with. Right, are there any more questions? If I could just come back, Leslie, and what Jill's saying, because I do find it interesting. Um, on how I'd be interested about the mechanics of uh, ground source heat pumps, because on the marsh we have a very high water table. <laughs> I shan't go into details, but you don't have to go down that far to find it. Um, and I'm not sure how much, how deep they go in the ground source heat pump to get the heat and then compress it. So I'll be interested on that, and I totally support what Connor's saying. Is we don't want to reinvent any wheels around here. If we can pinch any ideas from anywhere else, the more we know about what's going on out there, the better. So knowledge is definitely the power. Thank you. I'll absolutely send you. You know, I'm quite happy to to send you any information that we get. And um, you, you, interestingly, the, on the marsh, I'm informed um, by the, the people that know what they're talking about. Um, they don't have to go that far down if there is a high water table, because it's the, obviously the water that they're trying to hit with the ground source heat pumps. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it should it should mm. be quite interesting to the survey. Try two metres, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm, I'm not sure how, how how far they normally have to go down, but um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very, you know, very keen to see what happens. And certainly if, if we do have an assessment, I will share that with you. Thank you, that would be great. OK, well, if there's no more questions, it, it's entirely up to you if you want to stay or want to go, Jill. Obviously, it'd be nice if you could be around for the last item when we're talking about the Carbon Action Plan. But if you need to go. You know, no, that's, that's fine. I can stay. Thanks. Yeah, OK, thank you. Right. So we're moving on now to the update on the Sustainable Futures Forum, which I guess is you or Lou, is that right? Thank you very much. Yes, it is me, and I'm just trying to share my screen. <laughs> Can we all see this now? Yep. Yes, thank you. OK, then. OK, so um, I'm going to be talking about the Sustainable Futures for um, folks on a nice sustainable future for all, which is which kind was birthed from the Carbon Innovation Lab. Um, we have talked about the Carbon Innovation Lab with um, the Climate Climate and Ecological Working Group on the 7th of September. So this is basically work that stems from, from we have to deliver a district-wide carbon plan. So the idea was that we would, because we can't do it alone, we need to engage with the wider public, the you know businesses, community groups around the district. So we set up a voluntary forum called the Carbon Innovation Lab. We've been engaging with members through that. We've had um, four meetings thus far. Um, in terms of attendance, it's not been as many people that as we've that are on the register that do come, but it's been quite engaging and you know quite useful things coming out of it. We've had four meetings so far. The fifth one is happening this Thursday. And then, um, so based on it, we've had, um, out of it, we've had like things coming up. There was one of the sessions we had an ideas mapping session. Now we've kind of like been able to define key projects that are coming out of it, which is project one working with the schools, um, 
um, the project two was working with the businesses to reduce cost and become greener. Project three is focusing on energy efficiencies to reduce the cost of living for privately owned homes. And project three and four is to focus on a cycle and footpaths improvement. And um, in terms of that, we all know like, you know, budget and resources are quite slim. Um, luckily enough, we were able to find some under consultancy on the budget to be able to move forward one of the projects, which is um, working with businesses kind of but wider. So what we did, what we got was we set up something called Folkestone and Heights Sustainable Futures Forum. The whole idea is that we have a series of public engagement events because coming out from this Carbon Innovation Lab as well, we have been meeting online. There was that need to start to engage with wider people, the wider public and get input. So it's going to the Sustainable Futures Forum is a series of engagement events to produce a TEDx style talk. Um, communicating in um, talks and videos, communicating with a main event in April, spring 2023, and it's been led by Liu Bachelor. Liu um, is an independent company. She basically runs um, Liu um, LVB Creative, and she's a member of the of the um, Carbon Innovation Lab. She also has the license to do TEDx talks with Folkestone, which she has successfully done for a couple of years. So what we're trying to do is, you know, use that TEDx style because we didn't actually get the license, but we said the style stocks. And this is focused at businesses, community groups, individuals. What we've realized is there's so much going on within the district. We've heard of really amazing things. We don't know it all. So this kind of like putting ourselves out there to say, let's spotlight those things you know, spotlight those things, see how we can help improve them, create the support for them to be able to move to the next level with the wider benefit of impacting positively on the environment at large. So what is a TEDx? What is the TEDx program? TEDx program is an international program that is community driven and is bias free. It's created for the spirit of TEDx. The overall mission is to research and discover ideas what spread in. Um, it's usually planned coordinated. It's community by community, which is the whole idea. It's not us. It has to come from the people by the people. So um, the project one, the Folkestone and um, Heights TEDx style event talks, events and talks. So well, using it to uncover existing new projects, ideas, initiatives across Folkestone and Heights. As I said, we're featuring businesses, community groups, individuals. You know, you might have an idea, you might have a project, you might have something. You know, we tend to find out that a lot of things are happening in little silos. Every people doing things, meaningful things. But it's kind of like if we can all bring it out, work in it and, you know, spotlight it and hopefully use that to build on the next thing. And it's like I'm sharing sustainability projects, ideas and stories. And also because, you know, I thought it would be good to clarify the rules of the CI Lab and the Sustainable Futures Forum. The Carbon Innovation Lab is an involuntary forum, and the idea is to drive out the drive forward the local actions, basically to reduce carbon emissions across the district. And you know, we do have a mandate to develop to deliver a district-wide plan to to cabinet. That one is going in process right now with. The um, CI Lab stakeholder out has commented on chapter one to three of the carbon plan where with the next meeting that will be we'll be introducing the chapter four so we've kind of like um it was approved a cabinet structure which we're following kind of then the sustainable futures forum it's like an umbrella brand name so the idea is that projects initiatives emerging from the key ci lab or from the district we'll have to say we're going to do the cycle part we can say sustainable futures for um sustainable futures to run you know cycle part whatever name you know we used to call that but it's underneath the main umbrella of that and taking is about taking projects tangible projects forward across the districts that would help us to reduce this carbon emotions that we're all working towards so in terms of this engagement it's been going on so what happened was we had the launch on the 26th of november which was the idea was it's boxing day people are going out so put the word out there so we had the launch wrapping up quickly because it's quite a short time um turnaround we've had a couple of engagement events we've been to romney march we've been to i we've been to folkestone as well so um, we started off with question and answers just to, you know you're talking about this what exactly it doesn't mean you know we had you know a few questions people answering um, um you being there to answer the questions We've also partnered with Green Ideas Folkstone, which is, you know, a group that usually gets together 
talking about how we can collaborate and do green things around the district. And then it evolved to speaker and idea development, which is basically a workshop where I was at um, two of those workshops where you can kind of like use it to pitch your ideas. The idea is that by the time you keep doing it, you can refine your ideas. So Lou is going to be, so Lou is going to be off, um, the whole package is going to be offering the selected speakers, some sort of coaching to refine that idea so that they're able to speak at the main events to pitch the, their ideas. And this is just the timeline of it in terms of the engagement that has gone up thus far, in terms of um, right now what we're getting back is very positive feedback in terms of how much we're engaging with people. In terms of the turnout, one of the events I intended, I think there were 22 people. So it's, you know, it's it's been going okay. And then the main dates we're trying to look at, so we do have the speaker's application. The idea is if you have an idea, you have a project, you have a story to tell, submit an application. That closes on the 19th of February. So we're basically just pushing publicity, working with our comms team, um, external comms team, our community engagement team, um, um, economic development team, as many people as can really, just to push it out. It's on LinkedIn, it's on Facebook, trying to use as much as, you know, the idea is we don't talk enough about what we do and there's a whole lot we're doing. So encouraging people to put forward that says, as of yesterday, we have 13 applications already saying, you know, they want to pitch their ideas. And um, so um, when that closes in February, I actually just got an email because I'm one of the speakers. So we have volunteers for speaker panels who are going to be judging, you know, shortlisting those ideas. I've gotten an invitation already to say, once this closes, they're going to be sending us things to shortlist the, um, the, so that we can pick the selection of the speakers. On the day, we're hoping to have up to eight, eight to ten speakers, break it up into like, you know, we have a few talk. If it's, say, three speakers, have to, hypothetically, nine speakers, we break it off into three speakers, pitch the idea. We have some network, we'll do another three. We have some network, we'll do another three. And um, the main event um, tentatively is being looked at us to be the Saturday, the 29th of September. We're still trying to confirm the venue, but hopefully that will be all sorted out this month just so that we can start have enough time to start the publicity for that. In terms of the benefits of the TEDx style stock, we have to spot, spotlight the local initiatives, projects uh, that are um, ideas that have been going on. I've heard of some really, really amazing things going on. <laughs> and, you know, we just kind of like a lot of us feel, oh, my own doesn't really matter. You know, it's just really small, you know, but it's it's good. We're saying small, big, anything at different stage, let us hear about it, let us learn from it, let us spotlight it and provide support. Um, it helps to build confidence in promoting the ideas and the project. So the, what would happen is those who are shortlisted as the speakers, they would also be able to get a video clip of their pitch, which they can use to continue to promote their, their ideas or their projects. We don't want it to be a one-off event. We want them to be able to take it to the next level so that you know we can continue to be sustainable and impact you know, the community, the environment for that. And um, it's an opportunity to gain feedback. So they would have specific coaching session to refine their ideas, to talk about it. And you find out that at least with the session, I found out like there was one of the girls by the time she talked, she were talked to three different people. She was able to refine it and identify, identify our audience in the process. So it does help. Um, you get signposted to local resources. We're partnering with different people um, in terms of, you know, how um, we're partnering with people, different people and just asking if we can get sponsors, people, whatever. We also know that in terms of we have two people already saying their business code so they can help with those speakers to take or those projects to, to help them with coaching to take them forward one two sessions and um, possible funding so um from the climate change budget we've they've be, we've been with a max um up to thirty thousand pounds to be given to the first three at a, a maximum of ten thousand pounds per project to be given to the first three projects so that's an opportunity to not just know the idea but take use that money and the coaching and you know the the coach the coaching to pitch it and the business coaching afterwards to take it further so that's the whole idea of the sustainable futures forum and it's just one of the first projects with the hope that a lot more will spring forth because we do have at least four from the carbon innovation lab already that's about it for myself so i'm just going to end my slides if you have any questions 
Thank you very much, Olu. I'm, I have attended a couple of the events and I have to say the energy is really, really impressive. It's um, it's a really, really good project. And I really hope that a lot of you can attend the final event on the 29th of April because I think that will be fantastic. Right, if you could take the slide down, Olu, and then any questions from anyone? Connor? Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, sadly, I, I put the wrong date in for, for, for one of them, so I did miss it. But um, I think I think it's I think it's amazing. You know, when we when we sort of started, you know, this this group and, and you know, those, you know, a few years ago, we, we, we sort of we talked, didn't we, about, you know, how you can, you know, we were quite clear on what we needed to do as a council. But how, how can you affect change in, you know, outside of the council and, and, and influence others? So I think it's great that we're that we've progressed from an idea to this. Um, it just, just really, uh, just like to know how many, how many applications are there already, and and have you sort of, have you got a goal in mind in terms of what, what you, how many, how many participants do you think will make, you know, this event really, what, 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 it, what it should be. OK, thank you very much. So the, for the event, we're open. We're planning for 100 people in total to be at the event. In terms of speakers application, right now we have 13 that's been submitted. We don't want it to be too long. So we're hoping that if we get, we're working between eight and 10 speakers. The whole idea is you have like a 10, 15 minutes max to pitch your idea. So it's punchy and you're able to get constructive feedback in that process. So, the, which is, the, I'm looking at it, we just thought, okay, even if we shortlist and we are, because, you know, if we have enough application, we can shortlist the panel, the speaker's panel will shortlist and say, this are the, you know, nine to 10 or eight to 10 that spring up to us. It depends. Right now, we can't totally see, but we're working to a maximum of 10 in terms of the selection of, you know, the speak, the, the projects, ideas that come forward. Thank you. But the event, the event itself, we're planning for 100 people thus far. Any other questions? No? OK, well, that's really great. Thank you. If we could then move on to the um, water resources management plans consultations, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, hopefully this is uh, coming through on your screens. Yeah, I can see it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so um, this is a set of consultations that um, was launched shortly before uh, Christmas, and um, it uh, concerns the supply of, of fresh water to to um, to the region, really. Um, it, I've got to say it's been quite a difficult set of consultations to to sort of get to grips with and there are any number of sort of technical appendices to them. But um, what I've tried to do here is is provide a kind of a very brief overview. Um, if we want to respond to the consultations as, as a council, then the, the closing dates for, for all of them are um, the same date, uh, the 20, 20th of February, but I, I think given the nature of what's being consulted on, uh, we could probably only give very broad general comments. Um, so there is a regional plan being consulted on, um, which looks at the whole of the southeast in terms of water supply, and then sitting below that, there are the individual uh, water management plans or of the different water companies. So um, if I turn firstly to the regional plan, so this is a new pl type of plan that um, hasn't been produced before. It's a non-statutory plan, but the idea is that it would guide the statutory water plans of, of the companies that uh, sort of feed into it and sit below it. So th there are five regional groupings across the country and uh, we sit within the uh, southeast grouping. And the, the, the southeast is an alliance of six water companies and it, it stretches, um, includes Kent obviously and up to um, Essex and Oxfordshire and then down to Hampshire and the Isle of Wight and includes the, the London region. 
So the um, the water companies, the six water companies within the region are working together, uh, producing their own plans, but to the general broad outline of the regional plan. And uh, as I say, it's the first time that this has been done uh, in 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 uh, in the country like this. Um, so I don't uh, pr profess to be an expert in this by any means, but it seems to be a kind of process of balancing demand and supply while all the time recognising that there's a rising trajectory of increasing population and um, increasing impacts of climate change. All of the plans look to the period to 2075, but they will all be uh, reviewed along the way. And um, basically it's, it's about trying to meet the demand for water, um, whether that's through more efficient use of water and um, better standards of um, building and um, uh, goods, uh, and um, balancing that against the supply. So the supply might be the uh, construction of new reservoirs or new treatment works, but also um, towards the end of the 2075 period, they are looking at um, options including water recycling plants and uh, desalination plants. And also a, a part of this is about the transfer within the region of the southeast, but also between regions. So uh, transferring water from outside the southeast, so from places where the water is more plentiful and uh, bringing it into the southeast. Um, so what the um, what the Southeast grouping has done is to look to 2075, as I said, and they've adopted what they've called an adaptive planning approach. And this is basically recognising that while the first few years may be relatively easy to plan for, after that there are any number of things which may impact on water whether it's the increase in population that you might expect to to see over the region to the impacts of climate change and that the further you look uh, towards 2070 towards 2075 the more difficult it gets obviously to 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 um, plan but they've produced what they call a reported pathway through that and um, this is to meet Environment Agency guidelines. It's going with the um, growth that's set out in local authorities, local plans, but also trying to achieve a high environmental improvement. And that is largely by abstracting less water from, from rivers and the natural environment, while also factoring in quite a high um, quite a high allowance for climate change and uh, trying to reduce the the amount of of um, times that um, drought restrictions are, are put in place. Um, so um, essentially there, there are two time periods in the regional plan. Uh, the first 10 years there's some relative certainty in that um, schemes to provide more water are sort of already in the pipeline or are um, being prepared for, for planning permission. But then from 2035 onwards, there's much more uncertainty and the path that we take depends a lot on what happens in, in terms of population growth and, and the impacts on climate change. And so um, there's a commitment to review the regional plan every five years as the individual water companies have a commitment to review their their business plan every five years and to see what kind of path is being tracked and and just for for context um the regional plan says that um throughout the southeast region the water companies are supplying around six billion liters of water a day but to get us to where they think we will be in 2075 there's a need to find an additional 2.7 billion litres. So 
we're looking at almost half as much again by the year 2075. So they've prepared nine kind of scenarios which they're, they're charted on this kind of diagram and they have their reported pathway. So that is the, the pathway that I've outlined there in, in the red um, dashed box really. So as I say, for the first few years, there's relative certainty, but after that, what happens will be highly dependent on um, population growth and the impacts of climate change. But they anticipate that going with a medium growth of population over that time, which is um, looking at what local authorities are saying in their local plans and a high um, level of environmental improvement, by the time you get to 2075, we would need to find an additional 2.7 billion litres of water a day to meet the demand. And that additional demand by 2075, the 2.7 billion litres is made up of different elements. Around half of it is because they are planning on abstracting less water from rivers and that is to, to protect the environment and, and um, sensitive habitats, particularly things like chalk streams, which are vulnerable to, to too much abstraction. There's an element of that which is, and, and so that, um, that water which isn't abstracted from the environment has to be found from somewhere else. So that is an additional sort of burden on, on the system, so to speak. Also, there's an allowance for the additional water which won't be in the system um, and that is resulting from from the impacts of climate change. There is the um, additional water that will have to be found for the growing population and also additional water which will take account of um, drought resilience. So that is uh, are the various components that make up the additional 2.7 billion litres so um, the regional plan, it talks about reducing leakage uh, by at least 50% by 2050. Um, there's a national target to reduce the amount of domestic water we use to uh, 110 litres per person per day. The draft plan assumes that that is going to fall to 115 which is above the national target, but I'm assuming that is because the southeast is particularly um, prone to drought and has a higher water consumption than other parts of the country. Um, meeting that target is going to be extremely dependent on government because, um, of course, a lot of this is outside the scope of the water companies and it, it depends on um, the appliances that are so sold in the shops, so the washing machines and uh, dryers and these kinds of uh, appliances, but and also what is set out in building regulations uh, for new builds as regards water use. And the regional plan says that still in the first 10 years, there will be need for restrictions for drought management. So that is the kind of support um, demand side of it. On the supply side, the uh, regional plan talks about new sources of water and that includes construction in new reservoirs. Some are relatively advanced. Um, the one near uh, Chichester is, uh, is well advanced, but others are planned and particularly uh, closer to us is the, the Broad Oak Reservoir near uh, Canterbury, but there are others near, near Abing Abingdon. Uh, water recycling, the, the regional plan talks a lot about water recycling, which is sort of making better use of the um, of the water that comes out of wastewater plants, uh, treating that and introducing it back into the sort of water cycle further up the line. And there is talk about a uh, water recycling plant in Hythe, which they reckon will be needed by the 2040s, which are I'll uh, touch on a bit later. Um, 
proposals for improving groundwater abstraction and for storing more water underground so that less is lost. But also in uh, towards the end of the 2075 period, there are proposals for desalination plants. And again, there is um, talk about a um, desalination plant at highs, which they reckon would be needed by the 2040s. But having said that, the regional plan recognises that, um, and this is a quote from the plan, um, desal desalination as a process is kind of um, the option you would choose last of all in that it's um, energy intensive and costly and there are also potentially some impacts on the uh, on the environment uh, the marine or the river environment that you um, that you remove the water from to treat um, so in terms of what is proposed in the regional plan um, they kind of um, divided into two phases the first 10 years which is um, relatively more certain and then the la the latter period so for the first 10 years they, they represent it um, sort of graphically like this um, these are schemes which are relatively advanced in the planning or the construction as you can see there's not a great deal near our part of the world but um, the, it relies for the first 10 years on uh, water recycling um, around the sort of Hampshire area, construction of a new reservoir um, near Chichester. But there is, um, there is uh, the identification of a desalination plant on the Sussex coast near Brighton. Um, also the um, importing of more water from outside the region to, to the northern part of, of the southeast region, so the, the Essex area. And um, other schemes of uh, recycling or, or abstraction. So that's what's been proposed for the first 10 years to 2035. As I said, after 2035 to 2075, things become much less easier to to plan for but um, this is the proposals for the latter part of the period and as you can see comparing that with the first 10 years there are proposals for more imports into the region for, from outside to um, to Oxfordshire and to Essex uh, but also um, construction more reservoirs and as you can see on this diagram, much more of a role for desalination plants, including around the North Kent coast, but also um, coming down into our part of the world. Um, there is uh, proposals for the Broad Oak Reservoir near Canterbury by 2036, um, recycling plant at Dover but also, as, as I mentioned, a recycling plant at Hyeth in the 2040s and the Hyeth Beach desalination also in, in the 2040s. So that's a sort of brief overview of the regional plan. And as I say, I've got a few slides of the water companies, more detailed plans that sit under that. So turning first to affinity water um, affinity water supplies um, a lot of essex but also um, a discrete area around folkestone and hive um, the affinity water uh, water management plan it looks at the same period so that is to 2075 it is um, apparently the uh, area of the highest water use in the country at um, on average at uh, 157 litres uh, per person per day. Uh, but having said that, that is because um, 
it does cover large parts of Essex, which are one of the driest parts of the country. So it's not necessarily the the, the Folkestone area that's um, that's the culprit, so to speak, in this. But um, the um, the the area we fit within um, is relatively uh, self-contained and, and stands outside the the Essex area, and um, they are saying in their uh, Affinity Water are saying in their plan that that will be better able to cope at least in the short term. But um, uh, in the longer term, um, other uh, more more, um, more um, extensive interventions will, would be needed. The plan as as the regional plan has the target to to halve leakage by 2050. And it gives support to the national target to reduce domestic usage to 110 litres per person per day by 2050. But having said that, it does um, read in between the lines of, of the Affinity Water Plan. It sort of heavily hints that that's going to need a major effort from government to um, improve the water efficiency of, of the appliances that are sold in the shops and also the new homes that are built uh, throughout the country. Uh, so um, there aren't any direct um, sort of uh, strategic interventions planned for the Folkestone Hive area in terms of the transfer of water for, from, from elsewhere. And uh, um, as I said, the, the, the folks in the hive area is relatively uh, self-contained. That's um, water re resource zone seven. Um, they say in the in the affinity plan that um, demand management should be sufficient to maintain uh, the balance of water, unless and as the the plan is monitored and reviewed, uh, unless it looks like we're heading down a, uh, a trajectory of high environmental pressures. Adrian, um, I'm a bit wary yeah. of time because obviously we yeah. have another um, item. I don't know if we can skip to the end because you obviously need some sort of decision about whether we're going to respond or not, don't you? Yeah, certainly. Um, so, so um, how many slides have got to go? Um, yeah, uh, I was just going to briefly mentioned the the highest desalination and the water recycling scheme. The um, affinity water plans puts them in a slightly different order to the regional plan, recognising that desalination potentially has greater impacts on the environment. So it puts desalination, desalination plant right at the end of the period. And then southeast water, um, looking at similar kind of issues to, to, to the affinity water and the regional plan. Um, slightly less water use in the southeast uh, air, southeast area, which covers uh, the northern part of, of our district, but similar kinds of challenges. They've developed a preferred plan and an alternative plan. Similar kinds of interventions in terms of um, infrastructure, reservoir construction uh, and they have put together um, um, a target of 112 litres per person per day by 2050 for water use uh, and um, as I say um, reservoir construction at Broad Oak near Canterbury which is um, which is um, uh, set aside in Canterbury's local plan and also um, towards longer term desalination plants uh, uh, on the on the coast and uh, potentially new reservoirs and a second reservoir at Arlington. Um, and so um, their alternative plan is a slightly bringing forward some of the measures uh, if it looks like uh, demand is higher than anticipated and that um, uh, also to, to bring forward more environmental improvements. So. Um, lastly, Southern Water. Southern Water are consulting on a water management plan, but um, we aren't within uh, Southern Water's uh, water supply area. 
but they say in their water management plan that they will be producing a drainage and wastewater plan and that will be published soon but uh, wastewater and issues of drainage and uh, you know the discharge of water discharge of um, wastewater into rivers isn't part of this consultation but but will be um, coming up uh, soon is, is all we know so far so um, yeah that was uh, Thank you. Um, just a quick question from you, Tony, and then I think we need to decide what we're doing this and move on because I, I don't really want to go past half past, but I think we're likely to at this rate. Um, right, so far away, Tony. Oh, well, Leslie, you know you love it. Um, <laughs> thanks for that, Adrian. Um, yeah, if you contact Tom Henderson at County, yeah. he's done a response for us for the WRSE Southeast version. OK. Oh, right. Excellent. It's, and, and I'm more than happy for you to nick it uh, to save for office of time and it is useful. I had an email from Affinity Water two days ago saying, thanks for the large amount of rain we've had over the last three months. We're now, our aquifers are back up to where they should be. So no drought order next year. Um, but southeastern water is not in our area. And I think I'd, I'd give it a miss as far as you. Um, so it's our local region. When they first brought metering in down into lead, I was actually told by Affinity Water we were under 100 litres per person a day because we're a mean bunch down here. We've got no money. Um, so so basically it can be done, but it's done by a metering. Hmm. A lot of parts of the country are not metered. That includes parts of like London, which Affinity do have bits of. Um, so it's complicated. And as for uh, as three areas in Kent, I know of have been penciled in for uh, desalination. Personally, I want to see a station at Dungeness knocked down flat and with the uh, SMRs alongside, hopefully, we can put a desalination plant in there. Our biggest threat locally, just so you know, is the aquifer at Denge. A large amount of water is taken out of Denge aquifer. If through whatever weather and climate change we've got coming, sea level rise or whatever, if that gets contaminated like it did two years ago by salt, we could lose that and you have to rely on water coming from Dover. That is very serious. Uh, I know Affinity is hoping to take the water quota over from the power stations, but there's a lot to do on that. But anyway, that's the short version, Leslie. OK, <laughs> and a short one from you as well, please, Ian. <laughs> Yeah, I'll make it quick. Uh, I mean, if we're going to respond, I think we've got to include the fact that desalination is not realistic. If you look at the Beckton Works on the Isle of Dogs, built in 2010, cost of uh, £250 million, pounds. it's been switched off for years because of a combination of poor design and energy costs. Um, they're putting too much emphasis on this. Concentrating on reducing leakage is... Mm, I agree far more important will be far more effective. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Mm. I mean, I think it's great if we're going to reduce abstraction, but if we're going to replace that by something that's energy inefficient and is going to harm the sea, then I don't think that's a great solution. Right, one very quick one from you, Connor, and then we must move on. Yeah, uh, yeah only just quickly to, to sort of totally agree with Ian. I mean, I was a, you know, I was a young teenager when desalinisation was, you know, the, the buzzword in Australia. Um, you know, they've got nearly 300 plants uh, most of them can't be turned on all the time because the you know the, the the sunlight isn't powering them or the wind isn't powering them. Um, so yeah, uh, disappointing. Well, scary really to see that there's so many planned for 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 this country. So there we are. Well, perhaps we could share the slides because of course we can also send our own personal comments to these consultations. So if you've got strong feelings, obviously the time is short, but please do so. Okay, right. So we've got. Uh, about 10 minutes now to look at the carbon action plan. Is that you, Olu? Yes, it is me. Um, hello? Yeah, we can see the slides. Yeah, yeah. Um, just you can see the slides. OK, that's good. I'm not sure what happened there. So yes, I'm here to talk about the carbon action plan, give you an overview of it. Um, so Back when we declared a climate emergency, climate and ecological emergency, um, folks on the night commissioned laser energy to adopt and um, to develop a carbon action plan, which was adopted by cabinet in February 2021. Um, we used the 2020 
2018 and 19 to establish a baseline years, a baseline year, so that you know a monitoring year where we're going to start from. There were 33 action plans that was listed in that, and the whole idea is we can work towards that on our journey to achieve net zero by 2030. The main focus areas were the energy, the behavioral train, transport, water, contracts, and eyeball diversity, green spaces. Those actions are divided into short, medium, and long term. And it's, you know, right now we are progressing on that, but that will be discussed later as I go along. So, in terms of, I just put a few of the snapshots of what is happening. We do do um, a monthly, we do um, progress for the um, portfolio holder on this, but um, basically in the short term, we said we're going to do carbon literacy, climate change trainings. We have a mandatory e-learning model, which, you know, we've had to update because we moved it to a new platform. 367, three, 367 staff have completed the, um, the mandatory model. We sent general information out to members um, who completed um, a module as well that was um, organized by the local government information unit. Um, in the for the district, we actually now supply 100% of our summer beddings as um, pit free. In terms of converting the street light into LED, we've done all the completed all the two for the phase one, all the 321 adoptable lights have been upgraded to LED. We also said we're going to do a checklist of criteria into that decision making. Right now we have every report going to cabinet or corporate leadership team um, having a carbon impact statement. Um, we're trying to simplify and automate the process going forward, hopefully. Um, we have the Agile Working Framework, which is working very well. You know, people we do have um, within the office now, we have connection. These where people that want to go to work can go to work, but, you know, there's no more booking system, but it's worked quite well. Then the sustainable procurement policies for the medium term, we put a carbon criteria, carbon criteria rec reduction criteria into the tenders, and we're trialing it out for a while. And for the long term, we have things like work with the contractors to move towards the ultra low emissions. Um, suppliers for this have been identified, and um, I think it's depending on proportion of the contract, but they're working towards it. We also have. Um, We've done our strategy, we've updated our strategic risk assessment. We're working with um, Sket, um, Sket, um, Ken County Council on that. And um, we've retrofitted our homes, some of our homes as well. Um, just to note that, you know, those were just a few snapshots of the 33 actions. We're doing quite a whole lot, even outreach of the actions. So things like the social decarbonization we've won. We're currently working on updating 109 of our least efficient buildings to energy rating EPCC with the Ross House being like the exemplar scheme. We've put for the bid to the wave two. We've also completed the net zero toolkit, which you know um Jill had talked about we're going to be using to make sure that we can incorporate carbon reduction into our buildings going forward. So um why did we now ask for a review of this carbon action plan? At the start where we did it, it was pretty high level we just declared the climate emergency. We had to do an action plan. We didn't have enough and much expertise then. So it was very high level assessment. Um, we worked on the available data as at that time. And the requirements was that the actions will be reviewed and updated over time. Also, we're getting from, you know, service level officers saying it's quite high level for them to be able to translate to service area level. And we thought we need to, we're getting to the point where we need to quantify the carbon impact of this existing action. How far have we done? You know, how, how well are we doing? And the need to explore the emissions such as um, various other things also affect the emissions. We've just, we came out of a pandemic. We have all sorts of vulnerabilities on other external factors that were affected. So all we did was we put out a competitive tender and we appointed the consultant called Carbon Descent. This work was commissioned and started in September 2022. The scope of the work is to, first of all, stage one, review the carbon action plan, the current 2021 carbon action plan that had three actions and the expected impact to see, you know, how far have we gone from that time to here. And then there's a stage two, which is development of a carbon reduction plan with additional measures where applicable. And there's a, they did also quote for staff and day rates opposing, you know, and they're come of stage one and stage two, if they had to be called back whatever to do like ongoing support knowledge transfer or whatever we feel you know based on the outcome of 
stage one and stage two. So it's still, you know, with, it's still working with them, but they wrapped up the phase one, which we thought the stage one, which we thought is good to kind of like bring it to talk about it now. So what we've realized is that some of those 33 actions were very high level and they're like enabling nations, we will do something. They cannot be totally quantified into a ton of carbon equivalent reduction. And some others of them are quantifiable ones where we can actually have all sealed, you know, X tons of CO2 being saved. Um, we're still working with the scopes of, you know, reporting. We do report on our within our annual carbon footprinting. We do report on our scope one, scope two, and some scope three emissions. And what the consultants have done is they've distributed, divided it into scope A emissions and scope B emissions. Scope A emissions incl uh, were included in our initial beta's, and scope B emissions are not included in the baseline. The kind of like um, wider emissions, which we 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 have influence over, but not total control over. Um, the results of 2020, the the results by 2020, 2030, which is our target here, will be dependent on the speed at which the national grid. We talked about the external factors that would affect, you know, our own transition to net zero and how, you know, how we're meeting this target. So there's, you know, there's a lot of work going on the grid. There's estimation that it will be net zero, but, you know, not quite by 2030. Um, the consultants are currently using two models to look at it, kind of like best case and worst case scenario. As progress with that will be monitored annually to see how accurate those scenarios are. So I'm guessing the next step for us is, uh, you know, stage one, once, you know, we still have to take it to corporate leadership team, but the plan is that, you know, we can get the consultants to actually come to the working group to talk about, you know, it's quite a comprehensive thing they've done to talk about it so that, you know, you can ask the questions and all. And uh, we're also looking at how we start to, as a council, to communicate uh, council actions under the carbon action plan, which is what we have committed to do to kind of wider influence what we're doing and some of the work within the scope B in the emissions um, B kind of like the housing, housing shelter, that's what we talked about. Also relates to like the district wide, not necessarily our own immediate operational foot, organizational footprint. So basically those are the next steps really. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. It's still very high level right now, but they will be coming back, you know, if you want to give you a more detailed breakdown. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions? No, I mean, I, I'm just worried about the, um, the lack of coordination really with the work that's going on with the housing, because obviously that report is coming out soon. Um, and this one isn't going to be ready in time and, and I'm just not quite sure how they fit together. So I don't know, maybe that's something we can discuss offline, but um, it, it seems something we need to address sooner rather than waiting for the carbon descent report to come out. Connor, have you got something you want to say? Um, yeah, only, you know, uh, it's probably a long time ago in, in, in these meetings, you know, we, we had conversations about how do we how do we gauge you know what what we're doing and the actions we're taking you know simple kpis of you know our our where we were in terms of our output where we are now constant updates on that you know we talked about you know reporting on our uh, levels of paper usage and water usage and things like that you know as, as quite simple K, kpis to sort of well gauge what we're doing but also promote you know those sorts of things to the district to say where we are leading by example hopefully um you know so uh, obviously it's important to to reassess, but yeah, I I, I just think um, some of this some of this work seems seems to have been sort of just dragging on a little bit. Um, so hopefully, yeah, uh, yeah, something something a bit more uh, positive comes out of uh, out of all this out of all this soon. So our carbon descent looking at that sort of thing, Olu. Well, yes. So the next phase is basically they're going to have a CO two of emissions of you know where we are at now and the idea is map out do we need additional measures so this is what the conclusion right now they have is we within our 33 actions we're quite a way there but obviously it's based on we fully implement everything we've said within those 33 actions you know things like we will change our fleet emissions fleet to um, electric vehicles the onus boils on us to be able to do all that. So there's a capital cost involved as well. So they will be looking at the capital cost to say, you know, as much as we've said, we did very high level, we will, we will, but then there's a cost involved with it. So they will come back to tell us 
this is the cost involved with it and you know then i guess it's back to the session how we prioritize what we're going to do because a lot of those things were not they weren't actually costed at the first time we did it adrian yes uh, just to say really but part of the problem i think we've we've, we've encountered here is that um it's been very difficult to get the kind of raw information and um olu has done uh, a huge amount of work sort of um talking to to various different uh, teams to try and get the 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 sort of um the invoices that we're, we're paying out in terms of uh electricity use or 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 fuel use and so that that uh, that's unfortunately been been a bit a big part of the problem but i think we're now we're now more on top of it and and we can provide more more regular updates but, Again. Uh, yeah, I mean, just to come back on, you know, on that in terms of, you know, obviously these these this these works are going to are going to cost a lot of money, but uh, you know, the, I think the data is key. If you remember back when we looked at the LED lighting, the presentation from Fred, he made it very clear how much CO2 would be uh, reduced and 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 the cost of that, and we could we could make a clear comparison about, you know, we're going to reduce our CO2 emissions by this much and it's going to cost this much. So we could make an informed decision of, you know, is this best value for money for our, for this for the for the for the climate budget in in you know in reducing this amount of emissions. So the data is key on 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 big decisions moving forward. You know, you really need to know, you know, the cost, the, you know, the, the value for money you're going to get in 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 making those reductions. Can I thank you very much for that? Can I come back? As you said very rightly, we need to be able to, you know, the, the data is key. Like Adrian said, we are internally not as good as we can with data. So we're working on it. And um, I know, you know, there's been a paper, I think it's going to CLT about how they're going to move to teams, which is going to make it a bit more easier. Cause right now they literally have to look through the invoices to write the data. Cause basically what's happening is the as the more data we get, the better we're able to monitor it because what you can measure, you can monitor really. So it's kind of like going back to working on those data. And also in terms of, so I'll give you an example, in terms of even the grid electricity because of the way the energy prices are going, it's quite all over the place. <laughs> so we can actually, you know, so we're kind of like doing worst case, best case scenario. You have so many variable factors even in between that but obviously you know going forward we're trying to work better with data so that we can come back quantify those actions so that we can know what cost is involved which is the whole idea of the phase two to be able to tell us if you do so 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 and so and spend x amount of money you would get this Joe. Yes, uh, I echo what um, Elu and, and um, Adrian have said. It, 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 it is a challenge for us. I and mean, if we go back to your point about the independent living um, schemes, um, it is a huge challenge for us to interrogate the data and then translate that into um, viable costed actions because Obviously, we can we can look through the um, the electricity bills, the gas bills, water bills, etc. from from the schemes, um, and we now we know which of our fourteen independent living schemes are sort of high the higher energy users. But then, how do you then translate that into what works we need to actually do in those properties to then start to reduce those those bills? Um, and that's the that's the analysis and the co correlation that that we need to be smarter around with with the data as as the coming years you know sort of start to to give us more information. Um, so, so it is it is a huge. Are carbon descent talking to you or or your department? Is is that link in place or should it be? Um, the We're part of the interview, um, part of the the program, aren't we? Yeah, they've certainly looked at all the all the sort of bills and the current spend. And I I shared um, I've shared Jill's presentation with them. But um, we can we we can organise a meeting to make sure it's all um, it's all uh, um, as as tightly interlinked as we can. Yeah, mm, yeah absolutely, good idea. 
OK, we're a little bit over time. Are there any more points or questions anyone wants to make? Sorry, can I just add at the start of this, we actually did involve housing and we're trying to carry them along because most of it came from, you know, it's quite high level. So in terms of that, but since then, housing team itself has lost quite a lot of people. So uh, what we found out is when we were asking, you know, we wanted this, the data is not readily available because they don't have the staff to do it. But I know with the state too, they're going to be coming around to do site visits. So we, we are linking up and definitely I do speak to Jill. So we're going to try and link this up as much as possible because that's the whole idea. The majority of the emissions to emissions B is part of the housing. Of course. Yeah. Tony. Yeah, only a quickie to say that if you've got a spare hour or so on the 21st of March, please, please tune in on YouTube and watch um uh, my my committee uh for Kent flood risk management committee we've got the met office coming down for a update on the 10 year since last presented 2019 uh forecast for climate change and that should be fun yeah i will do because i i watched your previous meeting and it was yeah fascinating and worrying actually when they were talking about highway drainage and what That's budget right. they needed and what, what budget had, they've actually got it's so um, well we had five cabinet members for, uh doing your job at other districts came down which is great and i'm trying to get all 12 in there really uh because it's about dissemin dissemination of information and that's mm. the whole point of it. So I'm glad that, Leslie, had, you, it is meant to stimulate. Yeah, that was good. And just yeah. before we leave, Adrian, I just want to check that you know what you're doing with the consultation on the water companies. Are you going to respond or? Um, yeah, I've, I've um, while, while Ollie was talking, I, I emailed Tom Henderson and yeah. it, I'll, I'll, when I get, hopefully um, he's around and can respond and, when I get his response, I'll, I'll take a look at it and I'll add, I'll add um, Councillor McConville's points about desalinisation, de desalination, and um, I'll, I'll get them to you, Councillor uh, Wybrow, and and hopefully we we could then submit them by uh, the twentieth. Okay, that's great. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> it's a packed agenda, but I think we got through a lot, didn't we? So. Thanks very much, then. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye, Bye all.